Hey, this is Joe Van Cleve, and welcome back to the typewriter video series. Uh, this is Sunday evening almost, but Sunday morning, this morning, I logged on to uh, my local Craigslist, uh, just out of curiosity. You never know what you might find. And this is what I found. A Smith Corona Cougar. Stay tuned. So this morning I uh, found this ad for a little Smith Corona Cougar. Nice little typewriter. Went across town, met the seller, and picked it up. Brought it home and took it out to the workbench and to do a little work on it. And uh, let's take a look at this typewriter, shall we? Let's unclip the case. And look at this little beauty, huh? Nice kind of turquoise bluish little typewriter. That's a pretty cool little machine, I think. First, I want to bring your attention to the latching mechanism on the inside of the case. This is very similar to some of the Brother portable typewriters that have the clamshell case. They use a flexible piece of plastic with these little pawls that latch underneath the typewriter. But in, the, in this case, it looks like it's quite a bit thicker plastic and it's reinforced with a nice big piece of metal. So I'm a little bit more uh, confident in this uh, not breaking. Uh, I think one of my typewriters, one of my brother portables already has broken latches and I'm having to use uh, a belt to keep it secure. So you might notice, made in England, uh, SCM, Smith Corona Marchant. I looked in, briefly in the typewriter database and I didn't see a date code for for the typewriter here, but I'm guessing, well, so the build quality is not up to the standards of the 5, Super 5, or 6 series from the 1950s and 60s. Um, and it's it's an all plastic body, I should say. So that leads me to believe it might be 1970s, sometime in that time frame. But if you look at the keyboard, it lacks a, a number one key. And I don't know if that dates it to the late 1950s for that reason, or if it simply lacks the number one key because uh, it was an inexpensive typewriter in the 70s and maybe they left out the number one. I'm not really sure. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the uh, keyboard here in front. So we have a uh, backspace key on the upper right. There is a tab button on the lower right, but it has uh, preset tabs and apparently some kind of tab slug system. I didn't really look closely at that when I was working on it, but they're preset tabs. There's a margin release uh, in the upper left corner, and there is also a touch adjustment on the left side. And I will say, regarding the touch adjustment on this typewriter, this is one of the few typewriters I've seen where the touch adjustment actually does truly make a noticeable difference. It really is pretty darn light all the way up here, and it's really pretty heavy down here. And I find just about the middle position is where I like it. Um, of course, the space bar right here. And uh, it has a pretty standard American-style keyboard. Ca uh, shift and shift lock. And what I like about this shift lock lever, or button I should say, is it the shift lock button articulates. I don't know if, you can, if I'm blocking the light, but it, it pivots toward the front to make the locking action happen. See that? How the, the, the front of the key pivots down to actually lock, which I thought was different, rather unique. And on the right side of the keyboard is your ribbon bichrome color selector black, um, stencil, and red. Now one other feature that this machine has, it has the end set feature on the left end of the platen where you can align with the top of the paper when you first feed it in. Then it'll tell you when the bottom of the paper is coming up. Another feature this typewriter has is uh, to the left of the printing position is a little white mark and it is six characters to the left of the printing position and I'm guessing what it's for is for indenting the margin you would space over until the white mark is at your left margin and then you are spaced six letters over. That's the only 
thing I can think of that would be f what that would be for because the right guide over here does not have the same white mark. And then the other feature that this uh, machine has is on the paper bale there is a red mark indicating the center of the carriage and then there are some red centering marks on either side of it and that's probably for centering up uh, smaller size pieces of paper on the center of the carriage. The ribbon cover pops off simply by pulling the back of the cover and sliding it toward the rear. It has three uh, plastic tabs that interlock in little uh, slots in the front uh, of the body there and it's just a simple uh, cover like that. No locating pins. Okay, so underneath the ribbon cover, of course we have the uh, type bars and type slugs here. The uh, felt uses a felt strip underneath there to support the type bars. And they, it looks like the felt's in pretty good condition. So one noticeable thing about this typewriter is the ribbon spools are smaller. They're sub-miniature sized spools. And you can see the housing right along here for the ribbon spools. And it's too small of a housing to put standard size spools on. So when I replaced the ribbon today, I had to take a new ribbon and spool it onto the old, uh, the old reels themselves. Uh, it uses these little springs right here to help secure the ribbon uh, cover with these little two levers here to keep it from vibrating and it looks like it does a pretty good job of that. The ribbon vibrator, there you go, right there. The machine was in pretty clean of condition. One thing I noticed is the imprint point in the center. It's not real clear when you're typing as to exactly where the imprint is, especially considering that this is a 12 character per inch and elite font machine. So you have to be real careful if you're backing up and retyping something to make sure you're in the right position because this little wide V notch doesn't really give you a clear idea of where you're printing at compared to some machines. These right here are the auto reversing levers and the auto reversing mechanism on this machine works really well, really snappy. I haven't had any problem at all with it. There's also a little lever right here that you can barely see. It's red on one side and black on the other, and you can manually just flip it if you wanted to manually reverse the ribbon. Okay, so let's look at the carriage area of the typewriter. Uh, starting on the right side, of course, your platen knob. And there is only one carriage release lever. It's on the right side, so the left knob does not have a carriage release lever. And this is common with a lot of portable typewriters. In the back are your margin settings, and they're the traditional push, down, and slide kind of margin settings. There is a scale here for the printing position, and also on the paper bale, there's also an equivalent scale here. You'll notice the paper bale does not have any kind of a finger lever or anything. You have to kind of reach down in it to pull it up, and it does sit pretty flush against the platen. The bottom edge of it does, so that's a little bit not quite as uh, uh, ergonomic, I would say as some other machines that have a little lever on it, even the older Smith Coronas. Uh, it does have, though, the traditional rabbit ear style uh, paper support uh, that you see in the earlier like 5 series and 6 series Smith Coronas, so they've still stuck with that design element. So on the right side here, this is the pressure release lever uh, knob, and it in the forward position, the pressure rollers are engaged, and in the back position, they're disengaged to uh, free the paper up. On the uh, left side here on the top, there is a one and two uh, single line, double line selector switch, and this uh, switch is not uh, indexed. There's no notch or groove. It just slides continuously one to the other. So I imagine it's possible you could put it in some kind of intermediate position and get some kind of erroneous uh, line spacing. So make sure it's either fully up or down. Uh, then this disengages the ratcheting for the platen. So there is disengaged and there is engaged. And then the uh, carriage release lever full of greasy fingerprints from probably popcorn. Um, again, it your carriage release lever, but it is also spring-loaded. And the spring is right underneath, right here. 
And so when you store the typewriter in its sh case here, as you put the clamshell on, it just it just pushes the uh, carriage return lever down like that into a stored position. Okay, let's talk about condition. When I first uh, met the seller, she had a whole pack of maybe almost a dozen sheets of paper along with a sheet of what looked like watercolor art paper, so really thick, threaded in the machine. And I took those out and re-threaded one sheet of paper in it, and the pressure rollers would not grip the paper. I had a really hard time threading the paper up in the machine. But I figured I could probably deal with that. Also, the platen appeared very kind of glazed and uh, even kind of worn, and it still does a little bit. So that was one problem. The other problem I noticed was I had to push the space bar almost all the way down, almost pushing, applying pressure against the body before it would activate the escapement and make a space. So I knew I had some work to do with that. So when I got it home, I took it out to the garage and figured out how to take it apart. And so to take the machine apart, there are a couple screws. There's one here and one a corresponding one on the other side and then there are two screws one down here and one down there and that'll help enable you to release the bottom half of the body from the top half of the body but you also before you can take off uh, the top half of the body you have to deal with this carriage return lever and the shell of the carriage so you have to remove both not platen knobs which entails loosening up an allen set screw uh, on both knobs, pulling the knobs off, and there's two tiny little screws on the sides underneath the knobs that secures the plastic shell to the carriage. And then the carriage return lever, you have to disconnect the spring down here, and then there's a C-clip, or actually an E-clip inside that the uh, secures the lever to the shaft here, and you take that off, and that enables you to, uh, then you can pull the entire plastic shell off, and then that enables you to maneuver the uh, top case off from the bottom. And then the bottom, uh, the actual chassis is then secured to the bottom case with uh, two, two sets of screws back here with star washer and two up front near the space bar. And that gives you access to the machine. The machine itself was uh, surprisingly clean inside. There's just a little bit of dust I blew out. Uh, the problem with the space bar, right, turned out to be there is a linkage going from the space bar rotates a little rod and then the rod in turn has a little extension that operates a lever uh, and that linkage if you will goes back to the escapement and it, that linkage has a little bend in it it's designed to have a little bend and it was a little too flat and so it was actually too long and so that made the travel of the space bar before it tripped the escapement too long. So what I did is I bent it a little bit more. That shortened its length enough to where now the space bar was activating the escapement sooner than it was otherwise. So that fixed the spacing problem. <clears throat> what I did uh, with the uh, tension problem on the pressure rollers is having removed both platen knobs, that enabled me to pop the... the uh, the platen roller completely out of the machine. There's one little uh, washer on this side that's a bent washer and you have to be careful you don't lose it or you'll be down on your knees like I was looking for it on the floor. But anyways I took the platen off and I uh, kind of reconditioned it with some alcohol. It's not as good a shape as I've seen on some machines but it's much better than it was. And then underneath the platen in the middle is a curved metal piece that has both pressure rollers and there's a pin on the bottom of that that it's, it goes into a piece underneath and that whole plate kind of rotates freely to find its own centering onto the bottom of the platen. And what I did on that piece is the four corners of it are where the shafts of the pressure rollers attach and I bent those in just a little bit to make the overall curve of that piece a little tighter which brings the two sets of pressure rollers closer together and meaning that they are going to push against the platen a little bit harder and that fixed the problem with the tension on the paper so other than that uh, I didn't have too many other issues the only other real issue going on with the typewriter that I haven't really addressed I haven't had the time yet is 
the vertical alignment and some of the horizontal alignment of some of the characters is a, is a little off. So some of the characters are a little low, some of them are a little bit too far to the left, and that's just a matter of working with the type bars and individually taking each one and bending them a little bit and bending the type slugs to get them so that they're all vertically where they should be at the printing position but they're centered left to right and at the right height up and down and that's just a, a long drawn out tedious affair working with each one of those but I'll be doing that in the next a few days or weeks ahead. So overall I would say that this typewriter is not up to the standards of the Smith Coronas of the 1950s and 60s. It's quite a bit uh, uh, flimsier build quality, but I would also say that weight-wise, this is lighter in weight than my Hermes Rocket from 1953. Um, so it has that going for it, and if you put the clamshell on it, it's actually not much bigger than the Hermes Rocket, to be honest with you. And I think the typing action on it is certainly noticeably better than any of my brother made portables, ultra portable machines. Um, it, it's just a lot lighter of a feel. Not nearly as hard of a feel like the brothers. And as I said earlier, the touch adjustment here on the left side truly does work. It really does give it a light touch if you need that. So it's an interesting little machine. I think if I get the alignment of the um, type slugs uh, working better, this is going to be a good little machine to work on to type and use. And I love the color, of course, the aesthetics of it. The portability with the clamshell and the, uh, the lid is uh, uh, really nice. Uh, has a nice texture and feel to it. Um, the handle and the locking mechanism looks like it's quite a bit more rugged than the brother machines that I have. And so, despite its plastic outer construction and uh, its uh, evident lack of um, ruggedness compared to the early Smith Coronas, I really think it's going to be a nice little ultra portable. Well, let's uh, thread up a piece of paper in here, shall we? All right, let's do a little bit of test typing, shall we? Yeah, it's not too bad of a typing action. All right, here's a typing sample. It's a pretty standard looking uh, typeface. And there is a little bit of smearing, probably due to the rapidity and sloppiness with which I was actually typing. But uh, not too bad. And the actual letter alignment isn't really that bad. But there are a few letters, as I indicated earlier, that the horizontal and vertical position does need to be adjusted. And this brings to mind a point that when you're wanting to collect uh, ultra portable typewriters, this is something that you have to accept is ultra portable typewriters generally do not have the build quality of larger portables and upright typewriters. So this is a, a, an intrinsic compromise that you have to be willing to accept in order to have a collection of ultra portable typewriters. But in return, for accepting those limitations, you get a typewriter that is very lightweight, small, easy to carry. You can put it in a messenger bag, a shoulder bag, a laptop bag, and you can carry it with you different places. And so that's what I'm looking forward to with this machine is the portability factor and the aesthetics. It's a nice, pretty little machine. Well, this is Joe Van Cleve, and yeah, I have another typewriter in my collection. Well, until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day.